Welcome to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain seeking a frank discussion of American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash. My guest today is Dr. Terry Anderson, Professor Emeritus of Economics at Montana State University and John and Jean Denault Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution. Terry Anderson is Executive Director of the Property and Environment Research Center, a think tank based out of Bozeman, Montana. He's also the author of Free Market Environmentalism, as well as Greener Than Thou, Are You Really an Environmentalist? Dr. Anderson, welcome to Inside Academia. Pleasure to be with you, thanks. Your, your most known for is, of course, free market environmentalism. Uh, is it fair to say that you coined that phrase, sir, or is that something that uh, that was always around in the ether that never had much much of a body to it prior to your academic work? Well, certainly uh, the ideas were around in the ether, and the term may have floated around a few times, but when my colleague Don Leal and I wrote the book with that title, I think we claimed some property rights to it, uh, the appropriate term given how we focus on the environment. Okay. Most people, when they hear free market environmentalism, they probably think um, a, the, the interest of a certain property owner uh, wanting to keep his, his or her immediate environment in, intact for his personal use, but beyond that, if you had to give us a working definition and surmise it, what is the overall uh, idea behind your book, Free Market Environmentalism? When the book was first published, a reviewer said free market is, environmentalism is an oxymoron and then said the authors are the moron part, uh, which I think captures just how uh, most people think about free markets and the environment. Uh, they don't come together. They indeed are uh, enemies of one another. Free market environmentalism, in my mind, however, is a way of thinking about improving environmental quality using property rights and market. It links actions with outputs, with outcomes. What's particularly important, I think, is that free market environmentalism focuses on incentives. Incentives matter. Or putting it the other way, no one washes a rental car. I know there's a political component uh, to, to environmentalism, but precisely in education, I mean, you, you, you're a professor emeritus of economics at Montana University, uh, how, and you've traveled to many universities throughout the country, and you're a Hoover Institution fellow. Why is there, in your opinion, a lack of a sizable, uh, either a body of literature or a, a movement within academia to address environmental problems in the context of property rights? Or am I, or am I completely wrong in that characterization? <laughs> no, you're not wrong, unfortunately. Uh, although I would say that the body of literature and the knowledge of free market environmentalism is growing, uh, and, and, and I think growing exponentially. But let me answer why I think there's a, a, a real problem in the ivory tower, uh, and it is... It relates to, to uh, Friedrich Hayek, the Austrian economist, Nobel Prize winner, work on uh, how you bring together disparate knowledge uh, in a society. And Hayek recognized that people, each individual has special knowledge of what's going on at that particular time and place in his or her life. And Bringing all that together is, is, is the challenge we face as any society. And Hayek said, markets allow us to do that. We, I know that I'd like a little more clean water. You know you'd like a place for your cows. Uh, we somehow, we, we find ways to come together and use prices and markets to resolve that. People in the ivory tower think they know what's best. They think they know how to accumulate this knowledge. I mean, I am an expert. I know how to solve this pollution problem. I know how to solve this development problem. And if only you would call on those of us who are experts who studied it and who have bookshelves filled with documents of this, uh, and heavens, our own research, uh, then we could make the world a better place. And I think that's the, the sort of, if you will, arrogance of, of academics. Uh, it's really why I feel much more comfortable around that farmer or rancher than I do in many seminars. Well, on the note of academics, uh, one of the growing trends in universities has been uh, this new buzzword, sustainability. It's been in the works now for quite a few years, and uh, growing in a major university, you see a center or an office or a division of sustainability. Uh, if you had to define that, what, in your opinion, does that mean? 
Is it just a different way of saying environmentalism, or what exactly, in your opinion, does that refer to? Uh, I taught a course here at the Stanford Graduate School of Business for several years, pioneered a course indeed, entitled Environmental Entrepreneurship. And the students would come into my class, and these are, you know, high-level high um, MBA uh, students, come into my class uh, dreaming about sustainability. But when they left after the first day, they knew there was only one way to think about sustainability, and that's the, to think about profitability. And uh, I think too often it's that connection, that nexus that's lost when, when academics talk about sustainability. Uh, now, we could, we could imagine talking about uh, how many fish could we sustainably take out of a population and and not have the population decline. That's a scientific concept that depends on lots of, of natural phenomenon. But from that, it's a big leap to talk about how do we as human beings sustainably use a pasture or a, an airshed or whatever it is. And, and ultimately, things are sustainable for, for us as human beings if and only if they're profitable, meaning that the value of what we're using them for exceeds the cost. And, and I think you can't, you can't possibly use the term sustainability without focusing on benefits and costs, and, and I think that profits and markets do that better than any other mechanism for virtually every resource in question. Many people will say, look, we have to, we have to take a holistic approach to the environment because we have to preserve it for future generations. And if we reduce everything to a pure cost-benefit analysis, then uh, if it ends up serving us no economic good to preserve something today, then uh, how does that preserve it for future generations? What, what is your overall response to that premise? My first response is that if, if we want to think about future generations, we need to ask ourselves what kind of systems are most likely to look toward the future. Political systems where people are elected for two years, four years, six years, and maybe appoint themselves if they're dictators for longer periods, are they likely to look to the future generation or will a market system? And to be sure, people in the marketplace discount the future. Uh, and yet, over and over, we see people build skyscrapers that don't earn a net profit for, for many years, sometimes decades. That's looking to the future. But I think more importantly, to answer this question, we just need to ask, does socialism or communism deliver to the future generation more wealth and health than markets and capitalism? And the answer to that one is patently clear. Markets deliver to future generations more wealth, more health, more environmental quality than any other system. And I think that's where... Uh, free market environmentalism comes in. Free market environmentalism with environmental entrepreneurs uh, are the people who are looking to the future, who are looking to solving problems, meeting demands with current resources to make make themselves better off for sure, doing good, doing well for themselves, but at the same time doing good. And I think that's the key. Last question, since you're uh, a professor emeritus of economics. Why is it that the uh, sustainability movement never talks about the uh, sustainability of finances and fiscal sustainability? Well, uh, it should talk about that, and that comes back to my point about profitability. Uh, it's not sustainable for the government to continually enter into the energy market and subsidize various uh, uh, what, it, what the government thinks are winners uh, without some sort of market test. The market is the only way to test that. I think it, it isn't taken into account, that is, the, the, the profitability, the future profitability, the, the uh, uh, lack of deficits are not taken into account because the people advocating these solutions don't want to face the cost. It's great. Let me pick the winners in the energy field. Oh, no, I don't want to bear the cost. That's not part of what I should bear because, again, it comes back to I'm the expert, I know, and if only the market knew what I knew, it would be doing this. But it doesn't, so let me do it. Uh, if you think of history of humankind, to be sure, uh, and, and here in the United States as well, 
when water is, uh, to, to use the water example, when clean water is abundant for everyone, no one worries if a little bit of effluent is dumped into the river. And it's only after we, we use the river for a while for that that we begin to say, hey, maybe we should clean it up. Now, you can say that's an after-the-fact response, but we really need to realize that before the fact, no one thinks that clean water is a scarce commodity. Same with wildlife. Uh, when bison are all over the Great Plains, the American Indians didn't think about how they could build high fences, brand them, and uh, keep track of them. There were plenty to go around. It was only when they got scarce that private entrepreneurs fenced some in and, and actually built the herd back up so that now some of the bison, even in Yellowstone National Park, come from that herd. So uh, it, it does have a certain after-the-fact ring, but that's uh, uh, due to the scarcity component. The second point, though, that I think really needs to be emphasized is that if property rights are clear, then and I know that I want the water clean even before you dumped anything into it, I will bargain with you to say, let me have the uh, control of the property rights stick that restricts your use of water for affluence. Well, again, I just want to emphasize that cooperation. That's what people right. miss about markets in general and environmental markets in particular. Should there not be any need for any uh, environmental laws to uh, uh, safeguard uh, from pollution, for example, uh, ahead of time? Or, or, or do we just hope that people will cooperatively work things out ahead of time? For example, if a, if a refinery spills a toxic material that will poison the well, uh, for miles, so to speak, uh, and uh, the, the, the damage caused is, is irreversible, or let's say it has lasting effects for years and decades, wouldn't you agree, though, that that, that should have been proactively dealt with as opposed to retroactively? Well, I, I should emphasize I'm not a complete environmental anarchist. That is, I don't, don't think there is no role for government. And the first role for government is to help define and enforce property rights so that environmental problems are taken account of through the marketplace. Uh, I argue that all environmental problems are really property rights problems. So we go back and then ask what level should the government, uh, at what level should the government enter? Uh, it depends on the interaction of the, the number of people interacting. If it's one person with a herd of cows and one person downstream, those two people will bargain it out because they're part of a community, and uh, even if property rights aren't clear to start with, there's real incentive to solve the problem. I know a fisherman in New Zealand who had rights to fish in a certain bay. Uh, the water quality was going down because of a local farmer. He simply went to the farmer and said, I'll pay you to improve water quality. Uh, there, was, there was no bickering, no fighting, nor, no court challenge, no legislation. It's when we get to bigger problems with more people emitting effluent and more people receiving effluent that there's a, a bigger role for collective action. Whether that occurs at the local community level, at the county level, the state level, or federal level uh, varies, and we need to be cognizant of, of the importance of different levels. Let me use the example of, of water rights in streams that flow across state borders. The Colorado River has been compacted, that's the legal term, which divides the water of the Colorado amongst the various states that uh, uh, have, wa have, have Colorado River water in them. Once that's done, the states can then divide the water up uh, amongst the, the members of the states with clear property rights and tr let the trades begin. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is working on a program in Colorado to uh, help Colorado uh, farmers and develop, developers bargain over water rights so that they can meet claims that might exist from downstream states like Nevada and California. So the government's role then becomes one of establishing property rights and clarifying the rules rather than regulating. As we go up, as we go to, to uh, other emissions that cross many state lines, uh, sulfur emissions are an example, uh, if you can't establish property rights and the role and the government must then uh, regulate effluent, it's far better to regulate the effluent itself than to tell people how to clean it up. And 
that's where our environmental policy runs uh, amok. Okay, Dr. Terry Anderson, uh, Director of the Property and Environment Research Center. It's been a pleasure, and I want to thank you again for joining us today on Inside Academia. I'm your host, Andy Nash. Check us out again next week as every week on InsideAcademia.tv as we take you for a look behind the ivory curtain.